Whether you operate one forklift or thousands, one location or hundreds, the new My Toyota customer portal can help you optimize your operation and material handling equipment. This one-stop, free-to-use platform is designed to help you take control of your information and make smarter decisions, all at the touch of a button. Register and access your data today at my.toyotaforklift.com. That's my.toyotaforklift.com. The New Warehouse Podcast, hosted by Kevin Lawton, is your source for insights and ideas from the distribution, transportation, and logistics industry. A new episode every Monday morning brings you the latest from industry experts and thought leaders. And now, here's Kevin. Hey, it's Kevin Lawton with the New Warehouse Podcast. On this episode, I am coming to you. Uh, we're going to be talking to Tony Pelly, who is the Practice Director of Security and Resilience at BSI. Uh, you may remember BSI. We talked to David Fairney on B- of BSI previously. We discussed uh, porch pirates and theft within the last mile of the supply chain. So Tony's going to be on today. He's going to talk to us a little bit about um, the security and resilience team over at BSI. Um, he's also going to talk to us a little bit about supply chain theft in the current envi- environment, specifically talking about um, PPE shipments and how the demand for them has kind of uh, generated some more some more theft and security issues that have popped up. Um, so really interesting stuff. So Tony is going to talk to us about that. So Tony, welcome to the show today. How are you? I am doing well. Thanks for having me. Definitely. Thanks for coming on and uh, talking to us about this subject. It's actually something... I guess I I hadn't thought about um, until the email came through. So so why don't you start off, I guess, by telling us a little bit about BSI. Uh, We've had somebody on from BSI before on episode 45, um, but let's get a little refresher on what exactly it is that BSI does. Yeah, sure. So BSI is um, stands for British Standards Institution. Uh, It's a company that helps companies improve their their resilience, uh, whether that's operational resilience, uh, information resilience, uh, or supply chain resilience. And supply chain resilience is the piece that I work in. So in those other domains of resilience, BSI has a lot of um, standards that we've developed and a lot of standards that we help companies uh, you know, implement and certify companies to those standards as well. Okay. I work on the consulting side of the business, um, on the security and resilience team. And what we do is we help companies uh, anticipate, respond to, and, and mitigate uh, any risks that could um, kind of uh, upend the, the operation of their business uh, or, or make it so that the uh, the products or the services that they're delivering to people are, are not secure for for some reason. So we help people um, do risk assessments in those areas, build and develop programs in those areas, train them how to secure and, and their supply chains and, and their their operations and make them more resilient. Uh, and then also kind of help them measure that. What's the value of, of that security and resilience to the the entire operation? Okay, interesting. So I'm curious then what. Uh... What is your background going into this? You have, you have a background in security and supply chain, or supply chain background? Yeah, so I have more of a uh, more of a security background. Probably, I okay. started um, working in um, BSI as a tool called Screen, mm-hmm. uh, which is a, a supply chain risk intelligence tool, which has sort of geopolitical intelligence, supply chain risk related intelligence, uh, natural disasters, those types of things. And I started working on on that tool, and sort of then worked my way into the field. You know, once once um, you know, once I, I got a bit of a background in, um, in in advising companies on those types of risks, started working on you know, specific problems with specific companies. So I've been with BSI for about eight years. Okay. Uh, before that, I worked for a little bit in um, in export controls, which is a somewhat related, but but not exactly the same type of area. Okay, interesting, interesting. So so talk to us a little bit about now. You know, in a our previous episode with David uh, of BSI as well, episode 45, we talked about porch pirates and we talked about theft within the last mile of the supply chain. And now with everything that's going on with COVID-19 and the pandemic, 
Um, obviously, there's been an increase of demand and in some cases, increase of stress on the supply chain as well. We've seen, you know, certain products that are hard to get and things of that nature. And obviously, consumer behavior changes a little bit as well. There's more last mile delivery because there's more e-commerce happening because stores are closed and things of that nature. And people don't want to venture out to the stores either. So I'm curious, you know, what as this kind of demand increase, what new risks are you seeing within the supply chain from a security standpoint? Yeah, I think the the one that's most um, that's most striking is the risk to actual PPE shipments themselves. Okay. Um, the se- the second and, and related risk is just sort of any risk related to the last mile of the supply chain. So mm-hmm. as you're going direct to consumers more frequently, there's more shipments that are going direct to consumers, we're seeing more issues in, in that area, whether it's just from a, a kind of a, the perspective of, you know, on-time delivery or, or trucks getting, you know, lost or, or, or being unable to deliver to their, to their destination for any reasons or, you know, thefts of, of those types of shipments. Typically in the, the parcel environment, the thefts are a little bit smaller. We call them, you know, onesies, twosies, kind of here and there you'll see thefts. It's, it's less likely that you'll see an entire truck knocked over or, or, or get stolen, but um, those kind of thefts definitely add up in, in the long term. And, and we're seeing those two trends kind of come together as well. We're, we're seeing the thefts of TPE from those courier or, or last mile shipments as well. Hmm. Interesting. Okay. So, and then you mentioned in there, and obviously I definitely can imagine the last mile just because there's so much more volume pumping through the last mile right now. And it, I mean, it mm-hmm. continues to grow year over year. We see e-commerce growth, but especially right now is you know, people can't necessarily access things in typical brick and mortar fashion. And we're seeing, we're seeing the impact on that um, for the retail environment as well. But you mentioned in there the PPE theft. So that's something um, that I guess, you know, previously PPE was, uh, I guess, I think a lot of people didn't even know what PPE stood for. And now all of a sudden, you know, PPE is like this huge popular word. Everybody wants PPE, right? So personal protective equipment. So, so it's become, mm-hmm. you know, this hot item, in-demand item. In a lot of cases, it was difficult to track down things people are looking for, like gloves and uh, hand sanitizer and uh, masks masks and things of that nature. So, and unfortunately, you know, in the current environment as well, people have been looking to profit off of these things as well. So, so what kind of things are you seeing in terms of, you know, theft of this PPE and is it, is it on large scales or is it like the parcel scale that you mentioned before? Yeah, I think um, you know, by way of background, uh, just mm-hmm. the way that BSI kind of looks at, at theft and why certain things are targeted for a theft is, is not just how valuable that item is. So you'd think, oh, like, you know, the most stolen items are, are you know, high-end electronics or right. pharmaceuticals just because of the value of those items. And those are certainly targeted quite a bit, but in, in pretty much every country that usually the most targeted item for theft is, is food and beverage items. And mm-hmm. and the reason for that is one, just because there's a lot more food and beverage trucks uh, or shipments on the, on the road. Uh, the second is that it's a lot easier to kind of flip those things to the, to the black, black market. If you have a whole bunch of, uh, you know, high end phones, people are going to ask, well, where did that come from? How did you get that? It's, it's more difficult to put that back into a legitimate supply chain right. with food. You can go to a corner store or a market and no one will ask questions about sort of where that came from. And so mm. what we're seeing is PPE has moved into that category of just sort of tremendous black market value. And, and people are a lot less scrupulous probably than they used to be about where those shipments are, are, are coming from or where those, uh, where those orders of PPE are coming from. And we've, we've talked to people who are, uh, both orders and um, producers of PPE and, and and the orderers are saying we're having people from companies we've never heard of, mm. you know, approach us and say they have a million masks or approach us and say they have, a, you know, five million gloves or, or whatever. Uh, and then from the, the producer side, they're saying, yeah, we're, we're seeing buyers that we think are just flipping it, you know, directly to the gray market or, or black market. Mm. Um, so in that environment, you know, you're going to see a lot more theft of, of PPE and, and some of it is opportunistic. You know, a guy sees a truck that's parked at a rest area, um, wants to see what's in there. But some of it does appear to be targeted as well. So in, in one of the more recent examples, there was an entire truckload of, of masks um, <clears throat> that was stolen on the way from, I believe it was Portugal going into France. And there's almost half a, half a million euros worth of, of masks. Oh, wow. um, so a, full, a completely full truck. 
stolen out of rest area in Spain before it could get to get to France. And so that suggests that there's sort of a higher level of sophistication in the targeting there. I think talking sort of specifically about the courier environment or the last mile, um, a lot of that's going to be more more opportunistic. Um, you know, guy gets out of the out of the courier van, leaves the back door open, people kind of rifle through the stuff. Someone comes up, rifles through the stuff in the back, takes a few out, um, that sort of thing. Um, but as I mentioned earlier, that kind of thing can it can add up. The volume in each individual theft may be a little bit smaller, um, but over time it can it can definitely add up. Definitely, definitely, and something like like you mentioned the rest stop story where they sold uh, it was like half a million dollars worth of PPE. I mean, obviously that's something that somebody did some research on and was tracking. It was not just like, uh, oh, I just come across and let me steal this truck and see what's inside, right? So so yeah. what, what kind of preventative measures can companies who are dealing with PPE now in terms of, I guess, trying to acquire it or, um, I guess, uh, distributing it as well or selling it, you know, what, what kind of preventative measures can they take in along the supply chain to help um, circumvent this theft and prevent it? Yeah, one I think it it kind of starts with with due diligence on on the buyer or, or whoever is selling you the, the PPE. So asking them for sort of more verification of of who they are, how long they've been in business, and and looking at you know certain warning warning signs or indicators of you know are they asking for weird payment terms or unusual payment terms or are they changing the price you know very high or very low at the last minute that sort of thing comparing the price of the PPE that they're selling to, to other people then once i think it it actually gets on a truck um and and this can apply for both couriers uh or, or last mile and then also the kind of full truckload shipments that we're, we're talking about mm. um you want to plan for the shortest possible route and kind of minimize the stops if you're able to plan those routes or if you're able to, to get in contact with the, the trucking company <clears throat> tell them to minimize the, the the number of stops and and don't stop towards the beginning of the route or the end of the route because with those organized fees that you mentioned a lot of times they will follow shipments um, you know, sort of to their destination or they'll follow shipments right after they leave a distribution center. You know, they'll, they'll watch trucks coming out and they'll say, okay, that's the one we want to hit. They'll follow that one. So don't stop within the first 200 miles or so of, of any longer journey, basically. Uh, and make sure that if there are stops, they're, they're planned. Uh, you know, also make sure there's procedures in place to secure cargo in the case of security incidents. You know, if the driver gets sick, if there's a breakdown, if there's an unexpected detour, make sure that um, there's a plan for that that you're able to communicate back to dispatch, for example, that, hey, I'm stopped here, the exact address. Make sure that if you do need to contact law enforcement, you have those contacts you know, along the route. And, and also to um, inform drivers of, about these types of risks as well. So in a pre-trip kind of briefing or something like that, tell them, hey, if you think you're being followed, you know, please report back to dispatch. Uh, if you think that you, you are going to need to get into contact with, with law enforcement, please please let us know. Uh, and, you know, don't leave your truck unattended. Don't leave your vehicle running while you're not in it. Uh, we see that quite a bit where someone just leaves a vehicle running at a rest area and, and, and bam, someone someone takes off with it. Yeah. Make sure you lock and close all windows and doors while you're in transit and while you're getting out of the vehicle. And don't leave the keys in the vehicle either. So, so a lot of those kind of simple tips, I think, can be relayed to drivers, whether they're kind of, you know, delivery van drivers, courier drivers, or drivers of full truckloads. So just kind of keep them aware that, look, this isn't, a normal shipment, you're, you're transporting something that's a, that's a little bit more theft targeted. So, so to make sure you're aware of, of those types of um, the, the small things you can do to, to make your, your shipment a little bit less vulnerable. Interesting. Yeah. Yeah. And I think those are good points. And, you know, I think even coming, I think a lot of people, you know, that I've been talking to about, you know, what's happening during this uh, pandemic and the COVID-19 and the situation, you know, a lot of things are happening where, you know, we're saying like, what, what can we take away from this? And I think even these security measures that you're talking about, not even just surrounding PPE, I mean, there's security measures that, you know, we can take out of this and continue to use going forward as well, just to keep any load um, safe in general. So what do you think about in terms of, do you think that PPE is becoming so in demand and there's a desire to steal it and obviously somebody stole that the truckload you're talking about so there's a there's a demand for theft as well so do you think it's worth it for some companies to invest in some type of tracking technology uh for these loads and these supplies yeah i think it can be uh, when we were talking about 
the food and beverage shipments earlier. Mm-hmm. That's one of the reasons why they're so infrequently as well, is because on a per shipment basis, you know, that truck full of tomatoes is going to be worth maybe thirty thousand dollars. Tomatoes is a bad example. Let's say um, I don't know candy bars or, or energy drinks. Yeah. That's going to be worth thirty thousand dollars versus a truck full of phones or computers is going to be worth you know several million dollars. Right. So. The, the kind of cost benefit for using GPS tracking isn't there, but you know I'd encourage companies to be more flexible in their thinking about how they use GPS tracking or how they use Internet of Things devices to, to try and track um, where a truck is at a particular time. The, it, that technology is becoming in, increasingly cheap. Um, you know, it's it's it's, it's easier to use. The, the driver's phone, for example, is, is essentially a, a tracking device if he's got it on him while he's in the truck or the or the van. Um, so be a little bit more flexible in your thinking of, well, maybe this this type of item now is very hot, so we want to try and GPS track it where possible. And, and the cost benefit may be there um, just based on the kind of theft targeting of, of that particular product at that particular point in time. Um, so, so be willing to be flexible in your thinking about, you know, how you commit to certain security measures and the amount of money you're willing to spend on, on particular security measures and be able to adjust that quickly based on what you're seeing in the kind of risk environment. We always encourage companies to be, you know, a bit more flexible in that regard. Definitely. I think that's an interesting point of, you know, the flexibility and you have a, a good point there about, you know, looking at the truck full of candy bars or any drinks to 30,000 versus truck full of computers or cell phones that are so much more money, right? So it's an interesting balance too, I think, because, you know, PPE is um, unnecessarily an expensive item, right? Um, But, you know, like you said, you can have a truck that's worth half a million dollars of it. But at the same time, I think from a socially responsible and socially conscious standpoint as well, I think you get... It depends, you know, where is that where is that truck heading, right? So you're making a delivery to a hospital where first responders, right, need to uh, have that kind of equipment and stuff. So, you know, is it worth it to take that measure? I think it's a it's an interesting balance, and I think, like you said, as as more people start to adopt these tracking technologies, you know, the price starts to come down. And I think for overall supply chain security, I mean. Being able to utilize that technology and do the tracking is is worth it in the end, and it's you know it's better better to I think invest that money and spend that money instead of you know not invest it and say oh well you know we've never had an issue and then all of a sudden you have an issue and you're out all this money and um, so it's better to I think spend a little bit of money than to save the big uh, chunk down the end. I think that's exactly right because when people think about the cost of a theft, they tend to think only of the cost of the goods. But you made a very good point about how, in this particular case, there may be you know a reputational issue, and even just kind of morally, ethically, you don't want that shipment to go missing because it's important for people's health. Right. You know, there's also additional monetary costs, like the cost of an investigation, your your insurance premium is potentially going up in the future because of theft. So there's a whole range of factors to think about. And I, I do think that even for lower value shipments, the, the GPS technology can, can make a lot of sense. Definitely. Yeah, I agree. So it's, it'd be interesting to see how many people adopt that during this and then then continue that on to like their, their regular, I guess, regular in quotes, I'm doing quotes, uh, business uh, outside of the pandemic. Right. So I'm curious, you know, since you, you know, you're involved in the security and resilience uh, team over at BSI. So, so, and you mentioned the one story about the truckload being stolen at PPM. I'm curious, like in general, you know, what are, what are some interesting uh, stories of theft within the supply chain, that you could share that would help people to think about different ways to secure their supply chain. We'll be back after a quick break. You hear a lot about supply chains these days, because if the past couple years have taught us anything, it's that an efficient, well-managed supply chain is absolutely critical to keeping businesses successful and consumers happy. I'm Will Haywood, and I host a podcast called All Business, No Boundaries, where we talk about supply chains, how they work, what happens when they don't, and the innovations that are redefining what's possible in the world of logistics. Join me for insightful interviews with thought leaders and industry experts. We discuss how optimizing supply chains can break down the barriers that are holding businesses back. That's All Business, No Boundaries by DHL Supply Chain. Listen and subscribe wherever you get your podcasts. 
Yeah, so one type of theft that I, I don't think a lot of people, especially if they're not in a typically <clears throat> theft-targeted, I guess, category, think about is what we call fictitious pickups. And there's a few different ways to do a, a fictitious pickup. Um, you can basically say, hey, I'm here to pick up this load. <clears throat> you know, you're you're the thief, I guess. You're here. You say, I'm here to pick up this load. Um, the the wherever you're you're getting that load from the warehouse, for example, doesn't double check your identity to make sure that you are actually the person who's supposed to be picking up that load. There's a lot of warehouses that that you know still won't do that. Um, and then you just drive off with the trailer basically as if you were the company that was supposed to be picking it up in the first place. Um, there's more sophisticated methods of doing that as well, where sometimes people will steal the identity of legitimate trucking companies or trucking companies that have, you know, just ceased operating. So they still have like a, a DOT number, for example, um, but they'll use that number as kind of like here, I'm proof that I'm this trucking company and they'll slap a cheap logo or detail on the side of the vehicle um, and, and present themselves as that trucking company. Um, so make sure that you always verify the verify the identity of the truckers that are coming to pick up your, your loads. Um, and, and if possible, get as much early warning or, or information as you can in advance about who's coming to pick up your loads so you can, so you can verify it. Um, with regards to PPE, I don't know if we've seen any of that particular type of theft, but that is a, you know, a type of theft that's, that's out there and particularly in the United States, it's a more common form of, of cargo theft. Um, we also see too sometimes people will uh, get get a hold of the driver's cell phone number um, and tell them that instead of delivering to the original destination, they are supposed to deliver to a new destination. That new destination is here. Um, when they get there, they unload it as if it's a you know the thieves will rent some warehouse space. They will unload it as if it's you know the destination it's supposed to be. Mm. Trucker is none the wiser that his whole shipment has just been stolen basically because it's been redirected to a new a new location. So have protocols in place for, you know, if there is a legitimate reason for a detour or, or changing the route that the trucker has a, has a way to verify that, that it's real, <laughs> that it's coming yeah. through um, in terms of those, those instructions. Um, so <clears throat> those are kind of some unique, I think, types of thefts that we see around the world in the United States that, that, that people you know, may not be as aware of, but should definitely be looking out for. And, and thankfully in, in both of those cases, it doesn't take a really high tech fix. Um, to, to avoid or at least reduce the risk of those types of thefts, all it takes is you know a little bit better due diligence and a little bit more kind of um, a, a little bit more kind of um, systems of, of, of verifying and maintaining trust um, through the supply chain, basically. Definitely, yeah, and I think you have some really good points there, especially about you know checking the identity and the one where you said that, you know somebody try and do this, uh, I guess fraud fraudulent pickup, like it sounds like you're talking about, and so they would just kind of slap a makeshift logo or something on the truck and and that's i think it's difficult to combat because there's so many like smaller independent individual truckers or small trucking companies that i mean do just have basically a magnetic sign they just throw on the, the side of the truck because it's just a small company right and so it's mm-hmm. it's difficult to uh, combat around that. So it's, it's good that you're talking about, you know, double checking that and definitely checking IDs. And and I've definitely, myself, from my experience, you know, I've been in situations where I've seen not necessarily that's end up in theft, but I see, you know, where IDs aren't necessarily being thoroughly checked because people think, you know, eh, you know, who would who would steal whatever this product is that I'm selling? It's not something that's really really interesting right but um like you said everybody you know some things that people are not expecting to necessarily be a target of theft um could be because it it can Mm -hmm. move faster there's a there's a different market that maybe somebody knows about um that can get it out there so so definitely really interesting tips there um do you have any any like crazy theft stories that you're allowed to share at all or no um let me think. Yeah, I mean, once you get into um, into South South America or Mexico, you start yeah. to see some very very elaborate um, types of thefts. There was there was one where where we were working with a company and they had um, it was it was just a very small portion of the route, basically going from an airport to a distribution center, and always at the same spot over a three or four months time. Right. They they had gotten their trucks hijacked two or three times. And the first time it was just you know guy gets in the way of the truck or, or car gets in the way of the truck, a bunch of guys with AK-47 pop out and, and pull, the, pull the truck over. The second time, they actually dressed up as like a road crew 
So they got the signs, they got like the high vis vests and and the helmets and everything. Dressed up as a road crew, oh, wow. made it seem as if the road was closed. <clears throat> directed the truck to go to a different area, and then popped out with the AK forty seven, the motor truck, all that kind of stuff. Um, so that's that's probably one of the craziest stuff that uh-huh. that I've seen. You know, fortunately for the PPE stuff, we haven't seen anything that's quite that dramatic. Yeah. Um, you know, we've seen some. Some warehouse break-ins, um, we've seen a lot of the kind of opportunistic grab-a-few-boxes type stuff, mm-hmm. and then, um, you know, full, full truckload thefts of, of unattended trucks at, at, at rest stops and, um, and and gas stations, that kind of thing. Um, but, you know, fortunately, we haven't seen anything quite that dramatic yet for, for the PPE stuff. But those are those are some of the most interesting or, or some of the, the, um, the wildest, I think. Yeah. Cargo thefts that you'll see are in, in Mexico and Brazil are, are definitely the uh, the most um, checked out GPS jamming, all kinds of stuff, dressing up as, as police officers in some cases and, and doing kind of falsely pulling people over. Um, that's where you see the most sophisticated kind of uh, cargo thefts in the world, I think. Wow. Yeah. That's like the movies. I guess the movies are, yeah. the movies are real. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, and speaking of people always talk about the, Fast and the Furious, and I guess there's one scene where they um, they like steal something from a moving truck, or, or I guess that happens in real life as well, um, where we'll have people, you know, that come up behind a truck at 40 miles, 50, 60 miles an hour, to get on the hood of the vehicle, open up the back of the truck while it's all still moving, and, and start pulling, get into the truck, start pulling stuff out of the trailer and passing it back to the guys uh, wow. who are in the car behind. So. Um, there, there, there are some videos out there of this kind of stuff. There's one video from China that's memorable because they're on a motorcycle and the guy actually eventually falls off the motorcycle um, uh, as they're trying to pass stuff back to him. But uh, very creative. Anything you can imagine, anything that you've seen in a movie, it, in a lot of cases has happened in real life with regards to uh, the cargo sets in particular. Wow. Wow. That's crazy. So, so definitely uh, some great information and great tips and stories as well from you, Tony. Um, and happy that you could come on and share this information with us, especially for companies that not only just uh, need to focus on securing their PPE, but also just focusing on security and their supply chain overall. Um, mm-hmm. So how can people find out more about BSI and more about um, some security tips? Yeah, so there's a few different ways. I, I think one of the <clears throat> one of the primary ones, one of the best ones right now is BSI has a tool called Screen that I mentioned sort of earlier in the in the interview. Uh, it has all different types of, you know, this, those crazy stories that I mentioned about cargo thefts and those sorts of things, but also information about more business continuity related things, um, natural disasters, port stoppages, um, labor strikes, those kinds of things. Uh, what we're doing now is we're, we're making the information about COVID-19, including, for example, all, you know, border closures, uh, you know, air freight related issues because of the lack of passenger flight, fr- flights. We're making all that information free. Um, for the duration of the crisis. And, and normally it's a subscription-based tool, but we're making the COVID-related information free. It's kind of a, a public service to people so they can get that information more easily. Um, so if you if you want to check out BSI's screen tool, that's one area where you can get information about the types of things we've been talking about today. Okay. Um, my team as well is, is also always happy to chat with people about the, the types of supply chain issues they may be having or the security and resilience issues they, they may be having. And our information is available on, on BSI's website if you uh, go to the security and resilience page on, on BSI's website. Okay, great. And we'll put all that information on the newwarehouse.com as well so people can find it. So, Tony, thank you so much for uh, joining us and sharing these tips with us and information. I really appreciate it. Yeah, thanks for having me. You've been listening to the New Warehouse Podcast with Kevin Lawton. Subscribe and check us out online at thenewwarehouse.com. Thank you for listening to this episode. If you want more content from The New Warehouse, check out our new video series called All Hands on LinkedIn. Just search for The New Warehouse on LinkedIn and follow along.